Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, joining me today. I hope you're having a great time at Virtual Pass. Um, my execution, or my, my name is Janice Griffin, and my presentation is on a deep dive into execution plans and how to use them. Uh, here's just some, uh, you know, information for you from PASS, um, things you can explore. I hope you're uh, actually enjoying this virtual time. I know I, I'm getting kind of tired of virtual. I'd love to be back in, in, in the uh, swing of things, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been a longtime DBA. I've had over 30 years of experience. I started out with Oracle version three, if you will, years ago. And I now work, um, you know, I, I've worked with many other database types, but I've specialized in uh, what used to be Sybase, which is now SQL Server, and MySQL, and of course, Oracle. I am an Oracle ace. I had to sit down from the directorship this year just because of COVID. Uh, I'm not making the presentations as I have been and, and not out there in front of the public. So, uh, but I am an ACE director. And I came to Quest about two years ago. I worked with many other um, uh, monitoring tool companies. Uh, I really love Quest. I've been there uh, two years now. And I always specialize in performance tuning. And a lot of times I work with our customers, our prospective customers, um, you know, asking them and showing them about their database performance. And a lot of times they ask, how do I tune it? And so execution plans are a great way to tune. Um, if you want to give me an evaluation, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, they have to be submitted before um, Friday. Uh, before, I guess that's today uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern. So uh, uh, please, uh, you know, I'll fill out those evaluations. Okay, here's the agenda we're gonna do. We're gonna talk first about the challenges of tuning how to review the execution plan. We're gonna talk about all the steps in an execution plan. Uh, we're gonna talk about the evolution of the SQL query, SQL Server Query Optimizer. And then we're gonna understand all those features and how they work. And then we'll go into several case studies to bring it all home. Okay, let's face it. If you've ever heard me talk about tuning, uh, you've probably heard me say this before. SQL tuning is just hard. Uh, not only is it hard to even find who should tune, you know, you think a DBA wouldn't know how to tune, but oftentimes he's focused on keeping the lights on. And you might think a developer should do it because he wrote the code. However, a lot of developers are Java developers. They don't know SQL. They don't know how to write it. They often use third-party code generators in order to develop that SQL. Uh, even finding which SQL to, to tune is, is hard because um, there's a lot of SQL statements running in the databases, and you don't know which one is spending the most time and which one's going to... Uh, uh, buy you the biggest buck if you do tune it. Uh, and, uh, tuning requires expertise in many areas. You need to know how to re uh, read an execution plan. So that's why I hope you're here today. Uh, you need to know the different data access paths and, and which one is good for your query. Also, the join methods and which one to use. I also think you need to know how to write good SQL in order to um, make a good queries because a lot of times you may have to, you might find yourself rewriting it. I also think it's, it's important to know the business aspect of that SQL. What's its purpose? How long does it run? You know, uh, how many times should it run? And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many developers, you know, they will write a piece of code, put it in production, think it's going to be run once or twice a week and it's run a million times an hour, you know? So uh, it's, it's nice to know the purpose of the, that SQL. Years ago, I worked at a manufacturing firm and I worked in the finance department and taking care of their accounting database. And every month then I got complaints. And when I got to looking around this accounting clerk that had inherited this job through a reduction in force and she inherited these reports that she was running at the end of each month. And uh, when I asked, started asking her what she was doing with them, she said she's putting them in the file cabinet. Nobody was using those reports. so. The quickest way to tune, and this is my best tuning gig, was just to shut off those reports. And they got all the time back in their database. Tuning takes time. There's, like I said, lots of numbers of SQL statements running through the database, and there is no cookie cutter approach. You know, each statement is different. And then finally, uh, and this is uh, near and dear to my heart, I, I used to work in a, a network company where my VP grew up through the ranks uh, from the operations. So he had the wallet, if you will. And so anytime there were performance issues, he just wanted to throw money at it. And uh, the problem with SQL tuning is any poorly written SQLs are just gonna eat up all resources you throw at it. 
you know, it may buy you some time, but it's an expensive solution because uh, as the data grows and the workloads change, um, it's just going to keep eating up that resource and you'll be right back to square one. Finally, tuning is never ending, which is a good thing if you get good at it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is reviewing the execution plan. And management, or SQL Server gives you many ways to get an execution plan. You can get an estimated execution plan, which can be wrong for many reasons. It's blind to parameters. It only looks at the data types, so it won't see any implicit conversions. Um, you can always set show plan underscore XML on to actually get the estimated plan, or you can uh, toggle it in, in uh, uh, Management Studio to give you the estimated plan. The actual plan is good, but you have to execute it. So it could be dangerous to do in production, especially with an insert or update. And it can be wrong in test because if you don't have the, the right statistics or the makeup of the machine is different, uh, it could be wrong. Now to set that on, you can set statistics XML on. Uh, I always look at the actual plan. And you can also do a control M here in Man Management Studio in order to get the actual plan. One thing I like to do when I'm looking at the execution plan is I like to set statistics IO on and statistics time on. So I can get logical reads I like to tune with logical reads as well as see how much time it's taking as I tune. Okay, you can also use uh, profiler tracing. Um, that's the only way you could get the execution plan in 2000. Hopefully we don't have too many people out there that are on 2000, but you can actually show plan XML on 2005 um, uh, and up. And the problem with tracing is uh, you have to work, you have to know when the problem is going to occur because you don't want to leave tracing on all the time because it, it can be impactive. Extended events uh, came out in 2012. They will give you execution plans, um, you know, and we, I'll talk about those in a little bit, but uh, basically you can see the execution plan. Problem thing, the problem is you can't really see changes over time, you know, plan changes. Query Store came out in 2016. And you can see, um, you know, the execution plans and that, and you can actually see the plans change. So that's kind of a nice feature, but you have to turn on Query Store in order to get it to work. And then finally, my favorite way to get the plan is do DM exec query plan. And that actually pulls the plan out of cache. So you don't have to execute it. Uh, you don't have to wait for, you know, wait for it to finish or, you know, uh, you don't have to sit in management studio, you just grab it out of the cache and, and start working with it. Now, you in 2014 above, you could also do live query statistics. Now, what that is, is you don't have to wait for the actual execution plan to complete. And so you can actually see it while it's running. And that's good if you've got a very long running SQL statement, you don't want to wait for it to complete. Uh, you can see the live query statistics. Okay, the first thing I like to do when I find the SQL to work on is to examine the execution plan. And what I like to look for is the expensive operators. I look at the CPU and IO costs on the properties here. And then I also look at the row counts that it's, it's bringing back. And then I actually compare the actual rows to the estimated number of rows to see how good my statistics are. Because the optimizer will only be as good as uh, the statistic it has. So the execution plan that it comes up with, it needs pretty accurate statistics. So if they're pretty close, then that's good. Um, I also look for full table or clustered index scans, because those are probably reading far too many rows. Uh, not always, but uh, depending on the results set being returned, but if it's a small uh, result set and you're reading all that data, then you know there's room for improvement. I also review the predicate information. You know, uh, know where the parameters are being, uh, uh, know how they're being interpreted, look for implicit uh, conversions, I review the data types, uh, know which step the filtering predicate is applied. If you really want to have um, the data filtered and get the least amount of data first in the first steps of an execution plan, and then build on that for the select statement other than join everything together and then throw it out at the end, that's wasteful. Also review the join methods. Nested loops uh, join is usually efficient for smaller data sets. Usually when you have a, a parent or um, detailed, uh, a, a detailed table and a lookup table. 
Those are good for nested loin, uh, nested joins. A merged join is efficient for larger data sets and a hash match joins, they're used for very large data sets, uh, usually um, in, in OLAP type queries or data warehouse queries. Now, I've got quite a few pages here of the operators because there's quite a few operators within uh, SQL Server. And we're gonna briefly go through each one of these. Now, table scan is a heap. That's what a heap is basically a bunch of rows not stored in any order on disk. And so uh, when it goes, it has to do a table scan because there's no index on it unless you put a non-clustered index. A clustered index scan is where the data in the rows in the table are stored in the index at the leaf level. So basically it only has to go to the index to read the data. So very fast usually, but it's scanning that data. So it is no better than a full table scan, but it's ordered. And the rows are ordered by the clustered index key. So you can only have one clustered index on um, a clustered uh, table. Clustered index seek is you, it uses the clustered index key to get an exact match. So it's very fast. In fact, that's probably one of the fastest accesses you can get. Um, Non-clustered index seek uses a secondary index to find the clustered index key if it's a clustered index or it uses the row ID if it's a heap. And it, it keeps, it stores that in the um, leaf level of the secondary index. A RID lookup or row ID lookup is basically a non-clustered index uh, containing the uh, RID of the heap at the leaf level of the index. And it uses the RID to retrieve data rows from the heap. But it may have to do quite a bit of IOs because remember that data is unstructured, unordered in that heap. Key lookup is another uh, one where the non-clustered index contains the clustered key at the leaf level. So basically it goes, uses the secondary index, the non-clustered index, finds the clustered key and then goes get the data from the clustered key or clustered index. Sort operator, uh, sort operator is, at, uh, is um, at, when the data is retrieved, it's sorted by the columns in the order by. So it usually does that into a, a temp table. An aggregate operator is used to calculate aggregate expressions such as min, max, count, sum, all of those. So that's what an aggregate operator is. And you will see these steps in the execution plan. Uh, other uh, operators is compute scalar, and that's when you're either doing a conversion or a concatenation. And it's used to calculate a new value from an existing row. So you can see uh, my little example here, select name, and I'm, I'm concatenating that with at gmail.com. And uh, the concatenation operation basically is taking one or more data sets and, and uh, returns all the data. So that's uh, used when you use a union all. A cert operator is used to verify that insert values uh, meet predefined check or uh, foreign key constraints. So it actually checks it on an insert. Hash match joins, as I said, they're good for very large data. Basically during the join, the optimizer divides the data into equally sized buckets. And then it uses an algorithm uh, called hashing function to quickly access that data and, and join it. Hash match aggregate are used for very large tables that aren't sorted using an index. So what it does is it creates a hash table in memory, calculates a cache value for each row, and then goes about and searches that uh, and does the, the match that way. Merge join are used when two data sets are sorted according to the join predicate. It will read from two data sets at the same time, compare it, and then return it. Nested loop join is used to join the outer input by executing it one time with the inner input. And so like I said, in a, in a master detailed table, the optimizer decides uh, to use um, the, the nested loop joins when the outer input table is small. So that would be the master table and the detail table would be the larger table. So, and uh, it basically has an index created on the join predicate for it to use it. 
Segment operator is used to divide the input data into different groups based on their values, then it partitions the data into groups depending on their values. And then finally you have table spool operator, which is often called lazy spool. It uh, uses, it's used to build a temporary table in tempdb, and then it fills it in a, a lazy manner. It fills that table by reading and sorting the data only when the rows are required by the parent operator. So you have to look at the operator before it. Merge interval operator is used to perform a distinct query uh, by identifying the overlapping intervals and then merging it to generate non-overlapping intervals with no duplicates. And then finally, you have the filter operator it's used to check the input data that you know, satisfies the predicate expression, often used with a having clause. So you can, uh, you know, um, we'll see the filter operator on that. Online index insert. This happens when you, you uh, create an index online. And the operation, you know, basically is used for that online uh, manipulation to make sure nobody else, um, I mean, everybody else can actually reference it. Sequence, pro uh, project operator. It's closest to the segment operator. In fact, you'll, you'll see them side by side. And it can be seen when using a, a row number, a rank, a dense rank. And what happens is that the sequence project operator is used while classifying the data into groups. It adds one to the row count column while the segment operator is still working. So they work in conjunction together. Eager spool operator is used to take all the, the records passed to it from another operator. It reads all the data at one time, blocking any access to the data during that one shot read, and it stores it into a temp table. And then finally, a parallelism operator. Uh, SQL Server will manage to execute a query using parallel plan uh, to speed up expensive queries. So if it sees it, if, if the optimizer sees an expensive query and you have max degree of parallelism uh, set to zero, that says unlimited, then basically it'll paralyze, it'll parallelize um, the plan. And it also, uh, what the optimizer does, how it does it, it also looks at the um, query cost. And if it exceeds the cost threshold for parallelism setting, um, then it will parallelize it. So execution plans help you to tune. You know, what you need to do and what I often do is identify common mistakes. You know, using functions on filtered columns, filtering columns and aware or on or having clause, that will basically turn off any index it can use. Uh, nested views, one view calling or joining to other views can be very confusing to the optimizer. It might have to actually create the view and, and, and optimize that first before it goes on to joining to the other views. So, uh, if you don't need to use views, don't, because it, it's just uh, reading far too much data if you're not using all the columns in the view or use, uh, referencing all the tables in the view as well. Implicit conversions of column data types in the where clause or, or on or having clause, um, basically those are very high CPU intensive and they can really slow down a query. And also use of cursor or row by row processing is very, uh, bad to use in a relational database. You, you practically just tie uh, the hands of, you know, the filtering that a, a database can do with set processing. That's what they like to do. And then common warnings in an execution plan. I always look for those. I look for warnings. You know, there'll be a little um, yellow caution sign. Um, there'll be uh, fat pipes, extra operators or costly operators and then table or index scans. And I'm gonna show you examples of those when we get to our case studies. Also look for missing or poor indexing. The optimizer may suggest adding an index, but no, these may not be correct. So test and make sure that's the right thing to do. Because uh, I've seen a lot of people just all willy nilly add the indexes the optimizer suggests. And you know they either not use or they confuse the optimizer because there's too many indexes uh, on the tables. On uh, nested views, uh, again, optimize, the optimizer tries to transform or, transform or simplify the queries. If the query is too complex, the optimizer runs out of time to actually simplify it. And so it just stops assigning costs and just assume one row will be returned at each step. So you get really poor execution plans. 
you wear a parameter sniffing. And what uh, Optimizer likes to do is um, on the first execution, it likes to sniff and save off that parameter. Well, if you have data skew in your columns that you're, you're using, um, that parameter may not be the one, the, that value that it, it sniffed off may not be the right value for every execution. So be aware of that. And then problems outside of the execution plan, you wanna look for missing or stale statistics, uh, database misconfiguration, uh, you know, a lot of times default parallel settings are, you know, not changed. And so it's unlimited. So you've got everything uh, being run parallel. And then also no data constraints. Uh, database constraints can help the optimizer come up with a better plan. So here's an example of um, a cache plan. And notice here, I'm just doing a select star from DM exec query plan. And then I'm passing it this binary raw. And notice I don't have any ticks around, I don't have any quotes. And you, if you put quotes around it, you'll get an ugly error message and it won't say, don't put quotes around it. So uh, just, you know, it's a binary raw, so you just pass it in that way. And what you get is you get a graphical view of an execution plan. And you can notice here, uh, it's actually telling me I'm missing an index. And so, you know, and that's what the thing that I always warn people, don't just want, blindly add that. You know, think about what you're doing when you're adding indexes. But as you can see here, my high step is clustered index scan. You know, I look at the cost, you know, 34%, not that that actual percentage matter, matters, but I compare that with all the rest of the costs with all the other steps. I also look at the fat pipes. These are what we call the fat pipes. And that means a lot of data is being uh, returned from that step. So I've got a lot of fat pipes here. So there's a lot of uh, logical IOs happening. This is a little query that we were running on the other page. And like I said, I always set statistics I on. And you know, I'm selecting com customer information and order information from um, EventureWorks uh, order header. I'm joining that to customer on customer ID. And then I join customer on person, uh, on person entity ID to person ID. And then I join sales order, uh, sales order detail on order ID to order header ID. And then I uh, join product uh, to order detail product ID. And as you can see my filtering predicates, I've got, I'm looking for online order orders only. So online order flag equals one, last name equals uh, or like cus C percent. And then uh, product name like mountain percent 42 and then product ID like 9%. And you can see my logical reads here. I've got uh, quite a bit of logical reads, 75,000 in some in order detail. And I've got uh, 29,000, almost 30,000 in order header. So that's what I look for uh, in an execution plan. So once I go get the execution plan, you can see here, my high step cost is this uh, clustered index scan on order header. But my highest uh, step cost is um, on order detail, 56%. You can see the index that it's wanting me to add. Uh, I see I've got a, a fat pipe here. And I'm first uh, dipping into customer and person. That's what it's leading with. And then you can actually see it's also doing a key lookup, which is an expensive step. Uh, and we want to you know, evaluate why it's doing a key uh, lookup. It's using an alternate key of product name. So we want to go get more information about the indexes to understand why this lookup. Notice my little caution or warning sign here. I need to look at that as well. We'll come back to that. But first I want to talk about optimize, uh, what features are enabled in the optimizer. Now in 2017, they came out with adaptive query processing. And what that is, is uh, probably try to match Oracle because Oracle came out with it first, adaptive query processing. It's a little different, um, you know, um, Microsoft is in, implemented in a little different ways. Uh, it's done, in 2017, it does it in, in three ways. It does batch mode memory grant feedback. And really what that is, it recalculates the actual memory required for a query. And so it updates the grant value for the cache plan. So what it does is it looks at a query when it's running and it says, okay, it, it, if it's greater than one meg and must use greater than two times the actual uh, size needed, then it, it basically 
um, reduces that excessive memory on the next run. And so it actually fixes the underestimated memory grant as well if it, it gives it too less, because if it spills to disk, that's a, a performance hit as well. It turns this feature off if the query is parameter sensitive. So that's good to know. Um, batch mode adaptive join, and this is where they kind of copied Oracle. It defers um, the choice of hash join or nested loop joins on the first input. Uh, on the first execution. So it does it on the fly while it's executing and it actually sniffs ahead and, and it looks at uh, several buffers and rows and it says, okay, this is my threshold. And if the threshold is less than uh, you know, what it has calculated, then it uses nested loop joins. If it's greater than equal to threshold, then it uses a hash join. Um, I've actually got a, um, um, an example of that on the next slide. But you can, see, uh, you can see the threshold by looking at adaptive threshold rows property, and that, that will show you and give you that number. So you can actually guess uh, as uh, you're, you're running that query, which, what it's going to do. Well, I mean, you don't even have to guess, you can see it. Okay, interleave execution is another uh, way it can adapt. And that is uh, really kind of a fix around multi-statement -ta uh, table value functions. Uh, they used to have a fixed cardinality a guess of 100 in earlier versions. So if it got more data back than that, then it, the query was very untuned, if you will. Now, in 2019, they really went all out. And instead of just adaptive query processing, now they call it intelligent query processing. And adaptive is only a part, uh, part of it. So in 2017, the, the, these are all the ones that came into being uh, in blue. And then they added all of these other ones um, in uh, 2019. I have a whole presentation devoted to this. I'm not gonna go into much more of that, but what the whole point of showing this is, is to show you that you have to be aware of what is supporting your optimizer. Otherwise you won't know why it's doing what it's doing. Now, if you wanna see what, how your optimizer is configured, you can always, um, you know, and you, you can always upgrade. So for 2019, I can upgrade to 2019, but I can run it in compatibility mode and set it at 2017, which is 140. Uh, here, you know, I set it at 150. So you can, you can actually upgrade before you're really ready to go to that version and then set it at a, a compatibility level uh, lower than what the version is. Uh, that was, Microsoft gave us this ability uh, so people would keep up uh, with the new releases and you know, not just uh, hang on until they finally got their applications fixed to run on the newer applications. Now, uh, the joins, like I said, uh, they, uh, adapt, they dynamically change join methods during runtime based on the actual input rows. Um, and they decide whether nested loops versus house joins or vice versa. Uh, in 2017, it only worked on column store indexes. Now it works on both row store tables and column store indexes. So if you see this little query here we ran, oh, before I get there, I wanna show the select star from sys database scope configuration. And the one here says it's turned on. So you can see the last three is that adaptive processing for 2017, the interleave execution T TDF, uh, batch mode memory grant feedback and batch mode adaptive joints all set to one. So our query that I tested this with is um, I set territory uh, equal to zero and I selected uh, some total from sales order header and sales order detail joining it on order ID and I'm passing in um, that uh, parameter to territory ID and I'm telling it to optimize for the territory uh, ter territory of equals zero. And you can see what it did when we went and got the query, it's, it's doing a clustered index seek on order detail, very good. And then uh, doing an index scan on order, uh, uh, yeah, on, um, and doing an index scan then too on that. And then it does another um, index scan on order header and it says it's done an after adaptive join. Now, if you look at the adaptive join, what you see is you see that it's adaptive join, it chose nested loops, and you can see the adaptive threshold of rows, 103. So the actual rows returned were zero, so of course it's going to do nested loops. Now here's one where I've changed it to equal one, 
and you can see uh, adaptive join, um, they decided to do a hash match. And the reason why the adaptive threshold rows was 267 and the actual rows returned were 10,426. So of course it would do an, a hash join. Okay, we're going. Oh, yes, go ahead. Hi, Janice. Sorry to interrupt you. We have a couple of questions here, um, actually. From the, I'm going to start with the first one. Is there a way to use query store, but do not uh, but do not change other algorithms? We are migrating from an older version of SQL Server to SQL Server 2019, and we want to use a query store to check query plan, but are not ready to use the latest algorithm without fully testing. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a way. That's a good question. There's definitely a, a way to uh, do that. You just upgrade to 2019 and whatever, whatever compatibility mode that you're running in now or whatever version you're running in now, there is a compatibility mode level. So uh, if, let's say it's 2017. And so what you can do is you can set the compatibility mode to 140 uh, once you upgrade to 2019. And so all the... Uh, all the algorithms and the optimizer and everything will behave like it did in 2017. And then what you can do is you turn on query store, capture those plans as it runs in, uh, you know, in, in um, compatibility mode 2017. And then you, you capture that. And then at some point you upgrade the compatibility mode to 2019, which is 150. And what happens is it'll capture those plans too. So you can actually see the regression of the, the, the which plan regressed and decide to either force the 2017 plan or the 2019 plan. It's a great way to upgrade. Amazing, thank you. And we hope that um, Janice answered that question for you, Huey. Um, we have another question from Kristen who is our all access winner of this year's past Hi. summit. Um, it says, and it has a lot of, uh, you know, votes. It says, what would be the best way or ways to get index seeks on a non-equity joins? Index seeks on a non-equity join? Uh, oh, I'd have to think about that. Um, I think... I, I would, you would, I, the only way I could think of doing that is you'd have to do... Uh, maybe a greater than and a less than uh, query where, um, you know, on the index column. So, yeah, I, that, that's the only thing I come up with right now. Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Absolutely. I know that you can't just come up with it right <laughs> off the top of your head. And um, just a, a quick side note there, Christian, if, if you wanted to follow up with Janice on this, you're more than welcome to, you know, click on her profile and get in touch directly with her. I'm sure that at one point after this session, she'll be like, oh, yeah, this could have been, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I encourage Kristen to go follow up with you. And maybe, Janice, if you have a uh, take on this later after your session, you know, more than welcome uh, for you to elaborate on that. Yeah, Eric, thank you for that. Because um, I also want to tell people that I am going to uh, be manning the booth, at Qu the Quest booth. So if Perfect. you do want to join me there, I can answer questions there as well. I, I, I think I'm, I'm manning it from 4.45 to 5.45. And so it, it might be uh, uh, fun to join in. We have raffles uh, and, and a lot of things to have there. So uh, if you want to join, that'd be great. Absolutely. And, and yeah, thank you for that, folks. And Kristen, you know, if you wanted to follow up, just go head over there to Quest's booth. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conversation and discussions going in and you guys are going to have fun. Um, before we move into the, the case study, just one more question here from Kurt. Okay. It says, is there a way to extend the optimizer's timeout period to give less chance or estimating one row of output? Say that one more time, sorry. For, for sure, I'm sorry if I, if I was too fast. Um, is there a way to extend the optimizer's timeout period to give less chance of estimating one row of output? To give less chance of uh, estimating one row of output. Less chance, I, I, mean, I guess I'm not understanding the question. You know, if they're talking about rewriting the query to be the best uh, you know, and simplifying it, is that maybe what they're talking about? Um, 
Because the optimizer, what it does is it tries to go and look at the best, all the different alternatives. And it does that for um, a, a threshold. Now, I don't know if that's changeable or not. I'd have to look that up. Um, I, I would say well, if you'd follow up with me, I, I will look that up and get back to you because that's an interesting question. If that, if that truly answers what he was asking. Yes, right. and, and yes, Kurt, we encourage you to go and uh, go uh, follow up with Janice at Quest's booth. Janice, back to you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. Okay, so um, we're gonna go through some case studies now, and these are tried and true case studies. And we've seen my presentations before. You, they probably will be familiar to you, but they've been tried and true, not only for SQL Server, but I've done them over and over again in Oracle, um, what used to be Sybase, DB2, MySQL. So, um, you know, they are tried and true uh, case studies that kind of ring, bring it home. So this one was actually, it came in from a customer uh, who was actually, it was a university and they were having problems with their billing system. They couldn't get their billing out. And they were really trying to ask the business question of who registered yesterday for any class. I've changed it somewhat for this just because it's, you know, SQL tuning. So, um, but anyway, the query was this, it was select first name, last name and sign up date from student. And they joined student with registration on student ID. And they joined uh, registration, uh, uh, they joined uh, on class on class ID. And they were looking for where uh, the class name equals a class, which I've changed to be SQL tuning and sign up date equal yesterday, if you will. And then finally, uh, the registration table was historical in nature. So they never deleted from it. They just, uh, if a student dropped or canceled a class, they actually just marked it, uh, the canceled flag to Y. So we're only getting current records. Now I found this query and remember I said, what's one of the challenges of tuning is finding which query to focus on. And we found this tune, this query with the customer because it was top query running in his database. And we use wait time analysis to find that. And we could see that it's spending all of its time on ASIC network IO. Now ASIC network IO, a lot of the wait types have clues on how to tune. So, and what ASIC network IO means is it's just feeding a lot of data to the client and either the client um, can't consume it fast enough, so it sets an async net network weight IO. So um, uh, it was, this query was running approximately two seconds each execution, so it was pretty sluggish. And look at the logical reads. I always like to grab them to actually compare against as I wait. And as you can see, three million logical reads. Uh, so uh, we can actually get more information down here by seeing, um, logical reads, oh, I didn't get the row, uh, row count. I always like to get the row count too because uh, then I compare to see if that's excessive or not. I also gather all the weights. You know, I usually, when I'm looking at weight types, I look at uh, which one I wanna, you know, the one that's it's waiting on the most and I tune for that. And then, and then after I tune it, I look and see what's left. Sometimes the other weights will go away, sometimes uh, they won't and I'll have to tune for them too. So let's go get the execution plan. And we got an execution plan and, and also of course it's saying that it's missing an index. And we can see that it's saying, put it on uh, registration on canceled and sign up date. So I go see that the class, uh, their registration is doing a clustered index scan. So it's doing a full uh, scan of the table as well as it's uh, doing a table scan on class, which is a heap as a table scan means a heap. And it's throwing that into a hash match inner join, which is way off. That is for very large data sets. And this is a, a, a lookup table and this is a detail table. So that doesn't look right. You can see the fat pipe coming in. Um, so, you know, that doesn't look good either, as well as we, we've got a uh, index seek here. So that's, an, uh, that's a good one. That's a, a, a good uh, uh, step there. Well, let's go review the logical eye on it. When we run it, and this is a query just being run and passing dates, and I had about five um, sessions running this, passing in different dates, uh, just over and over again. And you can see that it actually, the logical reads were 400, um, but notice it put it into a work table, a, a work file. Um, so it, it actually did some extra steps here that aren't, aren't right. So I go review the table and indexes. And as I do, I can see that registration is my top detail table at 79, 
1,800. Class is only 1,000. Student is at 10,000. I go look at the indexes and, and you can see I have no index on class. In fact, it's a heap. Um, so let's go fix class. So I add indexes, I, use, I make it a clustered index and I add a unique index, clustered index on, on class ID. And then I also turn around and put a non-clustered index on class name, because if you recall in the where clause, one of my predicates, my filtering predicates was where class name equals SQL tuning. Well, you can see that it's now doing an index seek, which is great, but um, registration didn't, didn't uh, go down any. Why didn't it uh, do, why isn't it using the, why is it doing a clustered index scan? It should be doing a seek as well as I, I would think. Well, we go look at the indexes on registration and again, and we can see class is actually um, in the middle. So we're not using student in the where clause, so I can't use this index. So it has to do a, a clustered index scan. So let's add a, a created a non-clustered index reg alt on registration registration class ID. When I do that, now I've got a seek. My class has gone way down, and you can see uh, registration it went down from 400 logical reads to 63. But notice I introduced another step, this key lookup. It has to go back to the table to get uh, to satisfy all the rest of the columns from registration in the select clause. So it has to go back there, and that's why the key lookup. So let's do this. Let's add a better one. Let's create a non-clustered index, regal. On registration, class ID, sign up date, and cancel. Now remember, Management Studio said do canceled sign up date, or SQL Server said that. Uh, I didn't like that order because actually, cancel flag was not very selective. And you always want to create your index to have the most selective to the left and the least selective uh, to the right. So uh, this was the most selective class ID, sign up date, and canceled. And after doing that, you can see, uh, you know, I got uh, from 400 logical IOs, I got registration down to six. So, you know, I've tuned it. And that's how you can use your uh, execution plans to actually play with this data and actually tune, tune it. Any questions on that? I'm not sure. Sorry for that. Um, I'm not sure it's related to this precisely, but we did have a comment, uh, question coming in earlier. Um, okay. What, in what situations would I want to have a HEPA, a heap, sorry, or should I always have a clustered index for all tables? That's a good question. Uh, heap, heaps are not, um, not normally used in SQL Server. The only reason you'd want to use a heap is maybe with temp tables or very small tables where they're always in memory. Because you've got to remember, a heap is unsorted data on disk. And so you're going to have a lot of physical IOs as well as uh, you know, a lot, you know, uh, getting that off a of disk in order to, to get that data. And even if you put a non-clustered index on a heap, it still has to go and put that data all back together off of the disk. So uh, typically, I don't, I stay, I avoid heaps, but the only two reasons that you might want to use a heap is on temp tables and, you know, small, smaller tables. Amazing. Thank you for that, Dennis. Sure. Um, and thank you, Peter, for that question. Just quick, um, uh, Janice, a, a lot of people are asking about, you know, they want to see, uh, all, sorry, I'm going to read this. Is there any updated slide deck? All of those object definitions you just went through are not in the deck and yes, wanted to see yeah. if they wanted to use I, it as a quick reference. Yeah, uh, and yeah, definitely. I'm glad you, I'm glad, I'm glad they brought that up because I did uh, spend uh, this morning adding that. And so I will update the slide deck. Uh, go out uh, after this, you know, I'll put it up there this afternoon. So it'll be out there uh, either later this afternoon or tomorrow. Perfect. Thank you and for so Thank you. And Jeff, um, and for everyone else interested on that, please come back to the same location where you joined Janice's session and this pop-up window, and you'll be able to access those once um, it's refreshed and it's up there. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Back Thank you. to you, Janice. Okay, thanks, Eric. 
Okay, my second case study is a little meatier, and it has to do with a venture works query. And we're looking at, uh, and I've actually went through this uh, earlier in the slides, but we're getting customer inf and, and customer information and order information from sales order header. And we're joining that on uh, customer, on customer ID, and then we join customer to person with uh, business entity ID to person ID. And then order detail to order header on order ID, and then product to order detail on product ID. And that's our join criteria. And then our, our uh, um, filtering uh, predicates are um, order on uh, online order flag equals one. So we're looking for only online orders. Uh, last name like C percent, name like mountain uh, percent 42, the product name, and then the product ID of nine, like nine percent. Again, we found this through wait time analysis, top query in the database. Uh, look at the CPU usage, 97%. Typically, SQL Server is not CPU bound. And if, it, if you have um, CPU bound SQL Server instances, then what I would suggest is you look for implicit conversions or you look at your logical reads, because that really means that um, you know, CPU is reading lots of memory, not only thrashing your memory, but you, uh, taking up CPU cycles. So we can see this query actually taking up an awful lot of logical reads, 92 million logical reads. My uh, executions were only 490, um, uh, 39 uh, executions. And I, what is this, a 10 minute time frame? So not, not pretty sluggish. It was taking uh, 1.15 seconds. And you know, it did, it did um, about 400,000 rows to return, but still 92 million logical reads for that seems excessive. We go get the execution plan and of course see a lot of things pop out at me. Uh, one is the key lookup and product. Uh, we actually uh, have an alternate key here that it wouldn't use the alternate key and then it did a key lookup. So I had to go back to the table. Another was it did an index um, scan into sales order detail. That's my highest step at 54%. And then we did a clustered index scan into sales order header, um, you know, not quite as high, but then we also did another scan in customer. And notice we also have this little caution here. Now, when I set statistics IO on, you can see I have 127,000 logical reads in order header and um, about 80,000 logical reads in order detail. Let's go look at the index. Well, we have that alternate key that it was using on name, but it has a clustered unique primary key on product ID. Why wasn't it using that? Because that was also in the query. And then finally, it was doing a clustered index scan on, on um, person, but it had this index that it should have been using. And then uh, finally, you can see all the other indexes here as well. Now well, let's go investigate this key lookup and see why that's happening. So when I look here, we can see, well, our little cautions, you know, when we look at the properties on this step, you can see that basically it has to do an implicit conversion. So because I've got a uh, product like 9%, it had to change this integer of product that was product ID to a var car. And so it, it did that on the fly and that's why that warning. And that's why the key lookup. So let's change that. Well, and I always call this engineer out the stupid because a lot of times when you get and have to create queries and you, you're under a deadline, you just want to get it running. You don't really uh, pay attention to all the things you should. And so I stupidly put greater than to equal 900. When I, if I, all I've done is look at the range of product ID, it was one through 999. So I could have made it an integer by just doing greater than or equal to, it'd be the same result set. And as you can see here, um, it now is using the clustered index and doing a seek. So that, uh, you know, fix that there. I still have my high uh, step cost though. So let's go fix those. Well, this is one where management studio or SQL server actually said, you know, put a covering index on it, put it on order detail, product ID, and then include order ID and order quantity. What that does is it creates a very tiny index 
And you know, the order ID and order quantity, it's covered because it's sitting in the leaf portion of the index. So it isn't part of the navigation. So it's a very tiny, efficient index. And then it doesn't have to go back and do another IO to get the, this data that's needed. And as you can see, instead of 80,000 logical reads, it got it down to 116. But when I did that, look at the step of, of uh, order header. It, 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 the cost went up to 90%. So I decided let's put a covering index on sales order header and include all the other columns that it needed in the select. So it would do only use the index. And as you, we go there and look, it actually reduced it to 6,798 instead of 127,000. So uh, it reduced it greatly. Did we improve it? Yes, we did. As you can see from the wait time, instead of 97% uh, CPU uses, it went down to 64%. Now it's waiting. It got so efficient, it couldn't even run the 10 minutes. And you can see my average response time went down to 30, uh, 38 milliseconds uh, from 1.15 um, seconds. Um, my executions went uh, up by uh, throughput, went up by one and a half times higher. And then look at my logical reads. I got it from 92 million to 4.5 million. So uh, far better uh, performance there. Finally, my last uh, case study deals with uh, flights by city and day of week. And if you've never worked with a star schema before, um, it's kind of a fun uh, data set to download at the Department of Transportation. You can go download um, the, the, the data set and every, uh, it has every flight from every city in the United States for years and years. I don't know how far it goes back. And you can download their Excel spreadsheets and you download for every month, uh, you know, and I did that for uh, 2015. I did it for every month of 2015. And then I loaded it up into a uh, SQL Server. And then I wrote this stored procedure that basically uh, we're getting city and day flights to, and I'm passing in begin date end day, city, and day of week. And I'm joining that. And if you ever worked with a star schema, it's a, you've got one fact table usually, and then a bunch of lookup tables. So I'm joining and getting carrier uh, information, flight date, uh, flight uh, number, tail number, you know, originating uh, city and state uh, and airport and um, destination city and uh, airport, and then uh, the day of week. And I'm, I'm joining all those to, to the lookup table. And then I, I uh, actually look for um, flight date between the dates, if you will. And then originating city equals the uh, city that I'm passing in and the day of week that I'm passing in. Now, if you want to, you know, if you download my slides, you can go here and this will take you to that data set that you can download. But what you, what you end up with is you end up with these tables. You got one uh, fact table. And then uh, these four lookup tables. And this was running by far the top one in my database, spending it all of its time on an other weight, which actually is a CX packet. And as you can see here, uh, my baseline metrics, uh, logical reads were 12 million, almost 13 million. Uh, you know, uh, the response time was almost 16 seconds, so very sluggish. And uh, I didn't get row count again this time, but as you can see, it was very sluggish. Uh, and I went to get the execution plan. It was so tiny and was pages and pages, I couldn't read it. And so I, I, I actually, I had to zoom in to like 300, 400% to get this. And you can see it's doing table scan, parallelism, table scan, parallelism, bitmap, bitmap. It was doing this over and over and over again for pages. So it was pretty useless to try to look at this uh, execution plan. So I went to look up CX packet wait type. And CX packet wait type is more of a status. It's not, not necessarily a problem, but what it is is a coordinator waits on this CX packet wait type while all of its worker bees are actually doing the work. So if you want to see what is taking so long, you have to go look at the worker bees and see what they're waiting on. And you can run this query by doing uh, sys, by looking at sys DMOS waiting task, and you look at where the session is in DM exec request where wait type equals CX packet, and you get all of the work of these. And you can see I had three of them here waiting on access methods data set parent, and then it had a, an address. 
Well, if you look that up, and Paul Randall has a, a, a neat article out on the internet for most common latch classes, and what access method data set parent um, uh, points to is max degree of parallelism. And I had stupidly uh, installed a, a Azure VM and I you know, installed um, 2019 and I had stupidly not uh, set uh, my max degree of parallelism default. And so it was set to zero or unlimited. So what that means is every time SQL Server sees uh, you know, a costly uh, SQL statement, it'll try to parallelize it. And um, so I didn't want it to do that. You could, I could have given the query the hint and, and only turn it off for this query, but I don't, as a, as a rule, I don't like to have the degree of parallelism uh, set to the default. I always set it to one. But then, uh, so this is setting it at the instance level and then you can go reconfigure it. Okay, so I did that and it stopped all that parallelism nonsense, but now look at my, my uh, warning sign. And I'm doing a, uh, a, 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 a uh, implicit conversion on uh, flight date. It's actually trying to change it to a, a date time. And uh, so what I had done, because it was Excel spreadsheets, is I just um, you know, loaded them up with everybody, everything as a var, var 50. And so I had to fix the data type. So I recreated the table. And I did a flight date uh, instead of uh, bar chart 50, I made it a date time. And so I got rid of my implicit conversion, which you know, I, have, I no longer have the warning. Um, other things though, I, I wanna drive it by is a city market. And I do SQL diagramming, which I didn't really bring out in this uh, presentation, but it, it's, it's a handy way of being able to find which table to drive the query by. And you, you do it by looking at the filtering predicates and see which filter will bring back the least amount of data first. And as I did the math, it actually would bring back, uh, if, by going to city market, if I drove by that table, that would bring back the least amount of data first. So I actually put an index on city market ID description because that was in the where clause, that was a filter. And by doing that, you can see I tuned it. Instead of uh, spending all its time on parallelism, now it spent a lot of its time on async network IO. It got it down from 16 seconds per execution to 25 seconds. And then uh, look at my logical reads uh, went, went up, but it was because the throughput went up too. It did very much uh, a whole lot more um, executions in less time. The response time, 16 times, or you know, 16 seconds to 47 milliseconds, eight times better throughput. So uh, yeah, we did improve it. So in summary, there are a lot of challenges in, in tuning. Uh, you know, you, you wanna to monitor to wait time. I think that's a great way to find which queries to focus on. And then know all those steps in the execution plan uh, and, and actually, you know, look at the execution plan, look at the objects that that, that execution plan is touching and know how selective uh, your filters are. Uh, look for implicit conversions, uh, costly steps and, and bad database configurations. And then compare your tuning results and brag about yourself because no one else will believe me. I've been doing this for over 30 years and nobody's ever complimented me for making anything faster. <laughs> so that's it, uh, any questions? That's a, that's a great way to motivate yourself, Janice. And thank you so much for sharing these summary points with, with us. I'm sure they'll be helpful for uh, the fellas out there today. So yeah, we do have a couple questions. We have one, and I meant to interrupt you earlier, but you were right deep okay. into it. So I, I stopped, I let you go in. But I'm going to go yeah. back uh, like 10 minutes ago. James asked, rather than adding additional columns to the index leave, would it be good to do an include? Well, the include is adding the index columns to the leaf. Okay. So, so if you put it in the upper index, you just say create index. And if I did uh, cancel, you know, I might, uh, for registration, that the case, case study, I had an index called class ID, sign up date, and canceled all in the index. 
I didn't have to do that. I could have had a covering index, which would put it in the leaf, and that would have been uh, create index, class ID, include, sign up date, and uh, canceled. So that's, that is the inclusion, and that is putting it in the leaf that way. That way, that makes it very efficient because your, your index the navigation to get to the data is very small. It's only class ID. Uh, and then if I change canceled or sign up date dates, it doesn't have to uh, manipulate and fragment that index um, because it has to keep the index in order with the index, um, index keys. Hopefully that makes sense. And, and uh, to follow up, James, you know, if you wanted to follow up with Janice, again, and I can't stress this enough, she'll be available at the Quest booth. So if you wanted to get more insight and follow up on this, please be sure to visit Janice. Um, we have another question. What's the tool that shows the weight graphics? Oh, um, that's, that's Foglight. That's Quest uh, Foglight tool. Um, basically, we have a 30-day trial, um, but I, I use I, I like that tool because it not only shows me wait time analysis, um, but you can get um, change of things that change, like execution plan, schema changes, all that. You can also get um, uh, comparison features. You know, I, you know, if you notice some of my slides, I was comparing uh, the my performance after I tuned it. Uh, those are that was Foglight. Perfect. How do you go about tuning a query when you don't have the ability to create indexes on the tables in hits? It hits, sorry. Let me, let me just say that, was that okay, okay. The, the question? Yeah, that, I think I got it. Yeah, it, if you can't add indexes, and a lot of times people can't, and uh, especially if it's third-party software, you, you don't want to be adding indexes or anything. But you can actually do, you can change the execution plan without adding indexes. Now it may not, you know, of course it may not have an index uh, to use that, you know, so you, you, you can either uh, change it by um, a, a, a query plan. And um, those are, um, you know, the procedures that you put in and you place it to say, always use this plan um, when you are, uh, uh, see this, this uh, query. So you can actually force a query plan that way. Um, other things you can do is, is look at the tables. Can they be cached in memory? Can you use me uh, memory optimizations uh, techniques to actually uh, keep them in, in memory and make them much faster? So there's, there's different things you can do with that. Thank you for that, Janice. Um... Say you have hundreds of queries, how can you narrow it down to the query that is causing the issue? Is it just finding the query that is taking the most time? Yeah, yeah basically, if you use wait time analysis, basically what it does, and, and SQL Server uh, in 2000 and above basically has instrumented itself to record off not only the total time a query sits in a database, but it, it actually instruments itself to actually look at each step and tell you what it is, what resource it's using up or waiting on and tell you the time of that step. So you can get very granular and, and seeing not only which sequels, uh, with, where your end users are spending most of their time, uh, you know, but you can get, even get, break that down to where do I tune it? So that's what a wait time analysis is. Um, I do have several presentations on that. If you guys want to mail me, my, my um, email is janice.griffin at quest.com. And uh, I can send you those presentations because so they go into an in-depth to, to show you how to work and find the right queries to work on. That would be awesome. Yeah, I think a lot of people will benefit from those. So be sure to follow up with Janice. Um, we are wrapping up here. Thanks. Uh, before we go, um, I have a couple, you know, a couple of comments here from Melissa. Thank you, Janice. I feel like I learned a lot and have a better understanding because of your example. Uh, oh, so thank you. Uh, another comment from Thomas. Thank you, Janice. Great job. Uh, Bart says, Fog Light is a great tool. We use Wonderful. it. So <laughs> I guess it's, it's putting on to work all that work that you are. Um, good good right. work, all that you're doing. Um, if there is no more questions, I did want to thank everyone in the audience. Thomas, Christian, Peter, James, Mark, Jeff, Kurt. 
Everyone, thank you so much for all those questions coming through. Um, don't forget to visit Janice at Quest. I guess uh, right after this, are you going to jump in? Um, yeah, it's at um, yeah uh, uh, four four forty five, I think. Okay, well, we'll make sure Janice has a quick uh, water break <laughs> <laughs> before jumping in there. Um, so yeah, again, if you wanted to follow up with anything with Janice, she's going to be there. Uh, go visit her. Um, Katie asked, can you please repeat your email address? Sure, Janice. it's it's Janice. It's here. Uh, let me let me do one better. Let me go back to my slide. It's Janice.Griffin at quest.com. And I'll go back to my original slide. There. Perfect. So hopefully you can see it. There you go. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We are just a couple hours uh, away from wrapping up this amazing PAS, the first ever PAS Virtual Summit. So I hope you get to enjoy what is uh, left out there. We got a couple um, community things going on. So also be sure to fill in your session evaluation. Not only will you help Janice and Pass HQ to you know, improve, but you also might be able to uh, win a gift card or so. So yeah, be sure to do that. Thank you so much, everyone. Jonathan, thank you. Jonathan says, thank you, Janice. This session was awesome. Thank you, Janice, thank you. really. Oh, it yeah. was really informative. Uh -huh. And we'll see you next time, everyone. Have a good okay. evening and goodbye for now. Okay, thank you, everyone.